All right, so welcome back to the Biome webinar series. Um, so today we're going to be talking about something that you might have heard about a little bit, um, but maybe hopefully this, this will give you some more insight. All right, so today we're going to be talking about these two ideas, XRD, which is X-ray diffraction, and we're also going to be talking about pi mol. And so these two things go hand in hand. X-ray diffraction and pi mol are tools that you can use to look at these protein structures. All right, so I'm going to just be talking about this for the rest of today, for the rest um, of the hour. Um, and as always, let us know you're interested. I'm going to text the, uh, this link in the chat. And as always, please, please, please ask questions in the chat. I have the chat pulled up right here so I can see all the, all the um, texts that are going through. So definitely ask questions. And I'll also be asking questions along the way as well. So definitely answer there as well. OK, so today we're going to be talking about protein structures. Now, over the past few webinars, if you guys have uh, come to those, we've talked a lot about central dogma, right? DNA to RNA to protein. We've also talked a lot about um, these proteins themselves, right? They're chains of amino acids that fold up in very particular shapes. So these chains of amino acids, depending on the sequence, so for example, you might have amino acid one, then two, then three, then four, those different amino acid sequences fold up and they basically clump up into some defined shape. And so you can see these images here. And today, by the end of today, the goal is to have you guys be able to make these yourself. <laughs> so there's a software called PyMol, um, and PyMol can be used to make these images. And hopefully, that'll be pretty cool to visualize. Now, I'm going to split up today's talk in two parts. For the first part, we're going to be talking about how do you actually get the structure of a protein? These are molecular things. Right? They're tiny, tiny, tiny in size. How do we use our knowledge and understanding to determine the structure of a protein. How do we look at it on the atomic scale? That's going to be the first half of today's talk. And the second half is going to be how do we analyze it? What tools can we use? Hint, PyMol. How do we analyze the structure of these proteins and what use it, is it to us? And we'll see all of that as we go on today. Now, before I jump right into uh, this concept of X-ray diffraction and X-ray crystallography, I should bring up another type of X-ray, not X-ray, I should bring up another type of protein structure determination tool called a cryo-EM. And cryo-EM is the idea that you freeze your samples to really, really low temperatures. And after you freeze them, um, they get basically stuck in these orientations and you use an electron microscope to look at these orientations. And a computer can use these slices to piece together a three-dimensional shape of the protein. Um, yes, Leo, I see you raise your hand. How many proteins are there? <laughs> How many proteins? A lot. <laughs> there are How a whole lot of proteins. How many kinds of protein? How many kinds? I mean, there's a whole bunch. There are things like enzymes that speed up reactions. They can help, for example, be used as antibodies in your immune system. And they can also be structural molecules. So there's a whole bunch of different functions, whole, whole bunch of different types of protein. Good question. In cryo-EM, are the proteins denatured? No, <laughs> hopefully not, because if they were denatured, you wouldn't be able to solve its structure. So the idea is you basically flash freeze it, and if you freeze it super, super fast, it won't lose its shape. That's the hope, at least. All right, so anyways, moving on to the real sort of stage of today is X-ray crystallography. Now, I think we've all heard about X-rays before, right? X-rays are a type of light. It's a light with a very high energy. It can see your bones, right? And we're going to apply it to crystals. Right, so crystals are just regularly ordered arranged atoms, atoms in a very specific arrangement. And if we shine, if we shine X-rays at a crystal, so for example, I have a, some kind of um, an X-ray tube here that's making an X-ray. It hits the crystal, and the crystal diffracts these rays. As the X-ray passes through that crystal, it will interact with the atoms and the electrons, and it will spit out this beautiful pattern of dots. It might not seem beautiful now, but you'll see how those dots can be used to then go back to find out what the structure of that crystal was. All right. Now, that's the basic sort of setup of XRD. You have a crystal, and you shine X-rays at it, and you see what comes out the other end. Now, let's dive more into the theory of why this works. Why does shining X-rays at your sample give you a pattern in the first place? And how can we use that pattern to know the structure of that crystal? It's kind of like solving backwards. right? So check out this diagram here. We know that light is a wave. Now the physicists will say, oh, well, light is a particle and a wave, blah, blah, blah. For now, let's think of light as a wave. 
Now, we have two waves here, one here and one here. This wave at the bottom is the sum of these two waves. So you add this wave plus this wave, and you get this wave here. All right. Now, notice how sometimes there's nothing at all, and sometimes there's a whole bunch of waves like right now. All right. When does, and please uh, text in the chat, go off. <laughs> when do these waves show up? When is the wave super, super spiky? At what point right now, right? Why is that? What are the signals coming from the wave really large right now, right? The maximum amplitude of the first wave and the second wave occur when the waves form constructive interference, when the two waves reach a max amplitude. Exactly. So we call that constructive interference. They add to each other, right? Check it out. When this peak and this peak match, boom, we get a bigger peak, right? I mean, it's pretty visually obvious. You get a bigger peak if, you, if your two peaks line up. That's constructive. And of course, the opposite is destructive. So when you have a low point reach a high point, so for example, right now, right? So when the low peak hits the high peak, that's when you have a complete cancellation. That's when those two destructively interfere and you get no signal at all. So this is the key idea. If you understand this, you understand x-ray diffraction. Now, of course, there's a whole lot of math. Um, but for now, qualitatively speaking, this is what happens to form those patterns of dots. X-rays, light, waves, they can either constructively or destructively interfere. And at the points where they, where they constructively um, interfere, that's where you get these dots, these patterns. All right. Now, this is another image of that. When you have these two waves, right? So here, for example, this is like the classic double slit experiment. You have two slits in a wall, and you have a wave coming in towards the wall. But at that slit, at those two slits, it gets broken up, right? And those waves start interfering with each other. And here, they constructively interfere. Here, they destructively interfere. And that basically creates this interference pattern. You get this alternating light, dark, light, dark, light, dark because of the way these waves interact, right? This is kind of like the animation, the animation version of the wave that you just saw. So when you shine these x-rays at these atoms, the atoms are composed of nuclei and electrons, right? I mean, just take a guess. What do you think is going to be the thing that is diffracting the x-rays? What is scattering the rays off? Is it the nuclei or is it the electrons? What do you guys think? And I'll give you guys a hint. Um, it's not that it scatters. The electrons actually have to vibrate, or the nuclei have to vibrate, in order to release the x-ray off in different directions. They have to scatter off, right? So Genius says nuclei. Leo? I think it's the electron. Electrons? OK, we've got competing interests here, right? Nuclei or electrons? What is it that diffracts the, these x-rays? The answer is actually electrons. Right? And why is it? Because the electrons are very light. Right? They, they weigh very, very little. And so as the x-ray is coming in towards the electron, it strikes it. The electron can vibrate. And then the electron can then send off its own x-ray, scattering it off in different directions. The nuclei is heavy. And so the nuclei doesn't vibrate as much. Um, of course, there's a lot more physics you can get into this, but the nuclei don't scatter x-rays as much. And so when we're looking at these x-ray diffraction patterns, we're looking at the atoms that have high electron density. All right, let's move on. There's something called Bragg's Law. Right? And this equation, you don't have to memorize it because this diagram explains it all. Suppose, and now this was a huge, huge breakthrough. Right? I think like a couple hundred years ago-ish. Right? This was a huge breakthrough. So people show, shown, shined? Shown. <laughs> people shown x-rays at their samples and they got these dots, but they didn't know how to interpret it. There was a father-son tag team, <laughs> the Braggs, and they essentially looked at these patterns and they described it mathematically. Now, you don't have to understand this equation. All you have to do is understand it qualitatively. Right? Here we have two waves going through the sample. Right? So here we have wave one and wave two. And it hits the electrons and the waves bounce off. Right? It's being deflected off at this angle. Now, check it out. Because, let me annotate here. So this wave, do you see how this second wave, let's say that the, the detector is right here. Right? 
this second wave has to travel an extra distance, right? This wave goes here and then there, boom, done. This wave has to travel longer, right? To bounce to the detector. How much longer? It has to travel an extra by that much. That should make sense, right? Now, if that distance, if that extra distance traveled is an integer multiple of your wavelength, the waves constructively interfere. They add up to each other. Why? Because the peaks line with the peaks, and that adds up to give you the bigger peak. That was the Bragg's insight. The Bragg's insight was, oh, at certain angles, you will have constructive interference. And so only at certain angles will you get those dots, those signals. However, if you change the angle of scattering, so for instance, the, the wave comes here and it scatters off at a lower angle like that, right? Of course, there is still this extra distance traveled, but now that extra distance is not an integer multiple of the wavelength. And so, as you guys just told me, they destructively interfere, right? When the peaks line with the troughs, they cancel out. And so you get no signal. This is where there is a no signal. It's a blank spot, right? This is spots. This is no spot. And why? Because the angle matters. That's the key. If you rotate your sample, or some machines, I guess, rotate the x-ray source, if you rotate the angle in which you're shining your x-rays at your sample and the angle at which it scatters off also changes, at specific angles, you will get signals. At others, you won't. And you can use some math to work backwards um, to work out where those angles were. Now, notice here that we had to have this array. Andrew asks, so if we know the wavelength and test the sample at different angles, we know the distance between atoms. Exactly, right? If we know the angle of, um, that we shine the sample at, and we also know the wavelength of the x-ray, we can work backwards to figure out the spacing, right? That was the key idea. So precisely, Andrew, you can work out the distance d between your, your planes by using this formula right here, Bragg's law. That's how you work out the structure. Now, of course, that's a very simple structure. And notice that we had to have crystals. Crystals are necessary. If we didn't have crystals, they wouldn't interfere. So we have to have these planes, these ordered arrays of atoms, or I guess electrons, if you're looking at it from an x-ray point of view. So now, how does that have to do with crystals of proteins, right? Because it turns out that proteins can crystallize too. Of course, in your cells, it's kind of like a mess everywhere. Proteins are bumping around everywhere, right? We want it to crystallize. We want to make protein crystals, right? And look how beautiful that is, right? You have some kind of a, a drop of water and you look at it under the microscope and you can see the crystals forming. Now, this is honestly one of the hardest parts <laughs> about um, X-ray crystallography. The hardest part commonly is growing the actual crystal. This can take up to weeks and months <laughs> to grow a single good crystal. And of course, you need those crystals to be high quality or else they won't give you that nice diffraction pattern. And this is an image of a protein crystal, sort of in a cartoon form. You have, you have these regular arrays of um, these atoms, and you have this regular array of proteins similarly. And so these can crystallize, and you can form these beautiful growing crystals out of your sample. Um, I won't go into the details of how you actually crystallize it. You can subject it to a whole bunch of different conditions. Um, but after it crystallizes, then you can start to shoot your x-rays at it, right? Boom, boom, boom. So moving on, you, you load your sample right there. Right, right there, that tiny speck, you can't even see it because the, the crystal is so small. But you mount your crystal on top of this machine. See how it's rotating, right? We want to rotate to specific angles. And it, this is the x-ray beam. X-rays come out of here, right? And this is blasting the crystal with some nitrogen gas, some, some really cold nitrogen air to keep it cooled. Right? You, don't, you want to minimize that thermal motion. And so this x-ray blasts beams at the sample and then you have a detector in the back. This is an image of what that detector shows, right? Look at that. As you're rotating that sample, you get a variety of these, we call them diffraction patterns. You get spots here and there, spots here and there, a whole bunch of dots, right? Now, that might not seem too, <laughs> too beautiful to you. Like, what the heck is that, right? A whole bunch of dots. That's not a protein structure. That's the reciprocal space, we call it. That's the diffraction pattern that you get when you shine x-rays at the sample, right? And these, these x-rays are then detected by the detector. I see a question. Um, oh, <laughs> all right, moving on. Now, how do you go from your diffraction pattern to your structure? How do you go from this mess of dots 
to your actual structure. Now, of course, you can use a whole bunch of fancy mathematics. Back then, people used to do this by hand. They used to draw out the, the electron contours, but now it's all done by a computer. So the hard work was crystallizing, but after you put it in this machine, you shine x-rays at it, you detect this pattern, then you put this data into a computer. And the computer can then compute backwards. It can take this diffraction pattern using, for example, Bragg's law to figure out, well, what planes are there in this protein? And how do I arrange these electron contours to match what data I have? This is your data. You get a contour map out of that. Now check this out, right? This is the actual good stuff, right? This is where you actually start to see the protein structure forming because that, that mesh that you see, that's where the electrons are. This is an electron density map. And you can start to see the shapes of these protein structures weaving in and out, all right? Yes, Leo. I thought proteins and cells and other stuff and other organic stuff can sur survive in radioactivity, kind of like x-rays. Uh, perhaps, perhaps. <laughs> of course, radiation might be damaging a little bit, right? But um, we're, of course, we're assuming that the x-rays don't damage our protein, because if it did, that'd be bad news for us, right? Um, but it turns out that if you super cool it, that might help relieve the damage a little bit. So you're exactly right. It's a consideration that we have to take into account. Now, this right here, you might start to see if any of you are familiar with your amino acids. Um, this might look like a phenylalanine to you, right? It's got this kind of hexagon ring at the top, and it's got this sort of branch at the bottom, right? And so then you can start to see, you can start to model the protein from this electron map contour, right? Yes, Leo. I know a few um, amino acids. I know phenine, and that's actually it. I don't know any. <laughs> yeah, there's 20 of them, right? And the 20 of them are chained together to form your protein. Now, Andrew asks, why does it need to be x-rays? Why not other wavelengths? That's a good question. Does anyone else have an answer? Who wants to maybe maybe have a guess in the chat? I think that probably if it's any other wavelength, once you shine it into the crystal, you'll get a different result and it won't be the same. Yeah, that is true, right? You'll get different results with different wavelengths. Mia says you need high frequency and that is the key, right? The idea is a frequency, which is, um, you can also translate that to wavelength. X-rays have a wavelength of some number, I'm not actually sure about the number, but you need that wavelength to be on the scale of atoms, right? Why does that make sense? If your waves are super big, um, like for example, visible light has a longer wavelength than x-rays. If you shine visible light at your sample, then the wavelength is too long, right? The wavelength doesn't, isn't small enough to penetrate through inside of the electronic structure of the atom, so it won't actually stimulate those electrons to scatter off the x-rays. And so you want to have your wavelength to be at the right level. And that's actually precisely why, you know, electron microscopes can look at smaller things than light microscopes. Because light microscopes, they have a wavelength of visible light, which is longer than the wavelength of an electron. You can see smaller if you have smaller wavelengths. Um, that's why I use x-rays. Very good question. Yeah. So like, now, so like if mm -hmm. you have a microscope powered by radio waves it wouldn't even be a microscope yeah you wouldn't see anything right <laughs> wavelength is too long <laughs> exactly perfect now there's also the idea of resolution right you want to increase your resolution because that way you can see the details of your protein if you look at this 1.1 angstrom that's 10 to the minus 10 meters um that resolution you can start to see the details of the protein but as you get bad and bad badder and badder, <laughs> worse and worse resolution, then you start to see these kind of floppy blobular contours. And that's not as helpful, right? So there's also model validation. You want to be able to make it as good as possible. Now, I want to use this example. Now, um, Andrew, you're exactly right. You should use x-rays for atoms. But I want to use this example to let you guys think about you know, using, for example, a laser, a red laser. Of course, that's a different wavelength. You shine your red laser at, for example, a filament. This might be a filament through a light bulb. You take the filament out of the light bulb and you shine a red laser at it. And you look at the pattern you get at the other side of the wall. And this is the pattern you get, right? Check it out. You get this X, or you get these sort of like long lines, right? Why does this make sense? 
well, what is a filament, right? What is a light bulb filament? It's a helix, it's a spiral, right? Now, why does this spiral give this sort of X-shaped diffraction pattern, right? <laughs> wow, exactly, wow, right? How, because when I, when I see this, pretend that the spiral wasn't there, pretend you didn't know it was a spiral, right? How would you go from this X shape to the spiral? It's a kind of a hard question, right? Because I don't see the spiral anywhere in this. But an experienced crystallographer would. I, I of course, wouldn't. <laughs> but now let's try to go the other way. Let's try to look at the spiral and think about how we would get this diffraction pattern. First of all, we talked about crystals, and they have planes. Where are the planes here? The planes are here, right? You see those planes? That's where your planes are, right? And so if you think about, oh, I see something in the chat. I have seen this thing before. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, you might, you might have recognized it uh, from another image I'll get to later, right? Now you see these planes here. And of course, like the x-rays, I guess not in this case, the, the red laser light is gonna diffract off at that angle, right? All these are gonna constructively interfere when they're lined up. And so that's, this line right there. Right? I'll draw it in, in yellow. That's this line right there. And of course, you can go the other way too. Right? You can go that way as well. So that way, is, that's this arm of the X. Now, what are these two? Right? What, what do those two mean? Now, those two, of course, you don't have to draw your angles, your planes that way. You can also draw your planes this way. Right? You can draw them like this, um, like that, for example, like that. I'll put it in black. Right? So if you angle your planes that way, then of course, you get this arm you get this arm and you get that arm. That's where the X comes from, right? Now, why are there different spacings? Well, there are different spacings because you can draw these planes, maybe not like that. You can even draw planes like this. Right? You, can, you can double the, the frequency that those planes occur in, like why not, right? So each of these spacings also gives you different layers of your planes. And of course the angle is the same because the plane are, in the, are oriented in the same way. What about the two longer lines that form a cross? You know, that's a good question. Um, and so those longer lines might have just been caused by, um, let me see. So your helix has these planes here. That might have just been caused by the light going through the thread itself. And so as your, as your light goes through the thread itself, um, for example, just through these, through these holes inside of the, the filament, then it might get you these long lines here. So, um, does this interference pattern form for DNA? It is a double helix. Ready for this? <laughs> Does that picture remind you of anything, right? I think this is probably the most famous picture in crystallography. A photo 51 by Rosalind Franklin. Right? And Andrew, you literally read my mind, right? <laughs> a queen, exactly, right? A woman in science, go. So this picture, photo 51, was game changing for structural biology, right? This was a picture that uh, Watson and Crick then took to formulate the double helix of DNA. Now, it looks very similar to the one that we just saw, right? With the filament. Now, of course, this is using x-rays. And, and now also, I guess another side note is um, Rosalind Franklin didn't use a crystal, but she did use a fiber. But the same idea applies. The same sort of thinking applies that you get this x. And the x is indicative of a helix, right? Now, I guess. The, the angle at which that, that X is, that angle tells you how sort of tightly wound the helix is. So if it was more tightly wound like that, the X will be smaller like that. And if it was, you know, maybe like that, right, the helix like that, the X will maybe be like that. And so you get all these clues from looking at the X-ray diffraction pattern. Now, there are two helices here, right? How do I know that there's two helices? You actually look at the spacing. So here we see, well, we have this row here, we have that row there, that row there, but we strangely have this one missing, right? and we have another one there. Now, it turns out that that missing fourth row is what clued Watson and Crick into thinking, well, maybe there are two helices, and at that specific spacing, at that specific point, these waves just happen to destructively interfere. Right, there's no spot there because the x-rays coming in from here and from there, they destructively interfered because there was a second helix in the way. Right, I, won't, I won't go into all the math behind this, but there is a way that you can back calculate from this uh, diffraction pattern to figure out exactly how sort of how off-centered these two helices are. 
Any guesses as to what these are? Um, these top and bottom? Those blobs are? Constructive interference of something. Of something, right? Of what though? Not telomeres, not cell walls. This is a pure sample of DNA, remember that, right? It has to be pretty pure, you have to concentrate it pretty good. I mean, one coming from both the EVCs, like... Maybe, maybe, yeah. It turns out, it's a good guess though. It turns out that this actually comes from the bases of DNA, right? The bases are right here. The bases are in the center, right here, right? And so the bases of DNA are also going to diffract the x-rays that away and that away, right? And so those bases are what's giving you these blobs right here. That's when we know that the backbone of DNA is on the outside and the bases are on the inside. It all comes from this image right here. Now, of course, as we get to more and more complicated proteins, we start to, you know, <laughs> lose our minds because the pattern just gets too complex. And so we have computers do all the analyzing for us. And so we have our crystals, shine x-ray data, we get a pattern out, and we use a computer now to calculate our, where the electrons might be, um, depending on the diffraction pattern. And now we can also use some kind of software to you know, fit where the atoms are. Of course, we'll know what the, the amino acid sequence is beforehand, so we'll just fit it inside those contour plots. And then we get, finally, our atomic model. There's some refining going on, but I mean, at the very end, you will get yourself um, some kind of protein structure. That's how it works. Right? That's how X-ray diffraction works. And if any of you are currently Stanford students or Stanford undergraduates, um, we have a project going on. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm currently heading this project where we're trying to crystallize this protein right here, DMJHAMT. So this protein is an enzyme and this enzyme converts what's called fatty acids into what are called fatty acid methyl esters, FAMES. And FAMES can be used as biofuels. You can make this in bacteria. You can, you can basically have a flask of bacteria and you throw them, your, you, you, you have them make these fatty acids, you have them express DMJ HAMT, and they make biofuels for you. This could be the future, right? This could be what's, what's running your cars and, and what you put in airplanes to, to basically have them supply energy as fuel, right? So we're trying to crystallize DMJ Hamdi because there is a problem and the problem is it's kind of a crappy enzyme. <laughs> DMJ Hamdi is not a fast enzyme at all. It has a low K-cat value. Its kinetic parameters are not good at all. So we're trying to crystallize it. We're trying to determine its structure so we know where the active site is and how to mutate it so that we can optimize the enzyme. So that way we can make it good at making biofuels. What is FAE? That's a good question. FAE is fatty acid ethyl esters. So you see how there's that extra carbon right there. So it's another type of biofuel, but you can see that there's a longer pathway to get to it, right? DMJ Hamdi is a straight direct path to fame, right? Path to fame. So that's what we're working on. If any of you are currently um, gonna be in Stanford in the fall, um, next, I guess, next school year, then uh, hit us up if you're interested in this and working on this project with us. All right. Now, let's move on to the second half of the talk, right? We've talked about X-ray diffraction and we've talked about, you know, how we get these structures. Now let's actually look at, well, how do we analyze it, right? So first I'm gonna go to PyMol. So William asked, why DMJ HAMT? So DMJ HAMT is the enzyme that converts our fatty acids into the biofuel. And so by crystallizing that specific enzyme, we'll be able to optimize uh, its catalytic efficiency and hopefully make more biofuels. <laughs> is that enzyme from some specific organism or something like that? Actually really crazy. So the DM stands for Drosophila melanogaster. Uh -huh. It came from a fruit fly. <laughs> and this fruit fly enzyme just happened to make biofuels. It was honestly kind of serendipitous. Wow. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. And so these researchers discovered that if you can express this enzyme in E. coli, you can get it to make these biofuels. And so we're trying to, to do that as well. So we currently have it in E. coli and we're trying to crystallize it. Interesting. It's super cool, yeah. <laughs> All right, let's move on to PyMol, shall we? Oh, something in the chat. Fruit fly enzyme, yeah, it's a fruit fly enzyme. What was the enzyme used for before? So DMJ HAMT actually stands for uh, Drosophila melanogaster juvenile hormone acid O-methyltransferase. So the, the enzyme in fruit flies 
it was actually used to catalyze a step to make a hormone. And that hormone essentially helped the fruit fly mature from um, its, its you know, larval stage to its mature adult fly stage. It's honestly kind of kind of crazy that that enzyme can also be used to make biofuels, right? Kind of crazy that that happens. Jeannie asks, what other methods are available to determine protein structure? You can also use cryo-EM in the beginning, right? You can freeze it, you can flash freeze it, and you can take electron microscopy images and basically smush all those 2D cross sections together to form a 3D structure. You can also use something called NMR. There's something called protein NMR, um, nuclear magnetic resonance imaging, and that can also be used to determine protein structures. And so there's multiple ways, um, but X-ray diffraction is definitely the most common <laughs> right now. There's also a whole lot of hype around CrowEM as well. So really, really exciting field. Um, let's first look at PyMol. So PyMol, after you get your protein structure, you can upload it to a website, all right? So PyMol is a software you can use to look at these structures, all right? Um, so I have a protein ready. It's called 1QHA. That's the code. So if I say fetch 1QHA, press enter, boom. Right, that is your protein structure. Check that out. Right, you can use your mouse. You can rotate around. You can look at all the different angles. Yes, Leo. What is PyMol? PyMol. So PyMol stands for I think Python because it was made in Python, and then I think the mol stands for molecule. So it's a program that you can use to look at molecules. Right, proteins are just really big molecules. But how do you even get to look at all those molecules, and how do you know how to get them? So this actually came from protein structure determination techniques like X-ray diffraction. So you shine your X-rays at it, you get your data, you put it in a computer, and you make your model, and you upload it to a website. And I'll show you guys what website to look at. Um, but anyways, you can, you can type in fetch, and you can get the structure. You can look at it. You can rotate it around. You can zoom in by right-clicking. And you can also press your wheel to move it left and right. And I'll, I'll show you all that functionality later as well. Actually, you know, let's, let's make it a little bit more fun. What's your favorite protein? <laughs> someone, someone name a protein in the chat. We'll do this together. Keratin. All right, let's look at keratin, shall we? So let's go back to our, our screen, and let's go to this website called RCSB. Now, this is a website where a lot of scientists upload their data. All right, so let's look at keratin, and we can literally just search, right? Search keratin. And we get all these structures. Check it out, right? 6ECO, 6E2J. Let's just look at the first one, all right? So this is a website you can go to yourself and look at these protein structures. So this protein is the crystal structure of um, some domains of keratin, right? keratin 1 and keratin 10, whatever that is, right? It's from humans, you can see, but it was made in E. coli. And you can see how it was, it was determined using x-ray diffraction. So they crystallized it. And they, show, and they shot x-rays at it, and they got this structure out. How do we actually look at it? We take this code, 6EC0, right? 6EC0, 6EC0. Let's go back here. Let's reinitialize. And we do fetch 6EC0, and we get, boom. <laughs> That's our keratin, yeah? We can zoom in and out, right? And if you press this S down here, the S stands for sequence, and so you can look at the sequence. It starts with, meth with methionine, right? And you can look at the, the one-letter sequence of these helices. There's also other things here, right? There's all these other additional things that aren't necessarily amino acids. Where do you get 6EC0? Oh, good question. Let me show you back in the website. It's the code you see. So this right here, 6EC0. And so you type in fetch. 6EC0, and then you get that structure out. And so we have the structure here. Um, what does it mean? Oh, honestly, I have no idea. <laughs> it's a code they have. Um, does X-ray crystallography also determine the presence of alpha helices and beta sheets? No. So X-ray crystallography gives you the positions of the electron, the electron contours. But then we have uh, our model where we put the atoms inside. And some other program can then analyze, well, um, does this look like an alpha helix or does it look like a beta sheet? And then it can also make those into cartoons. All right, so we can also look at the pure sort of atomic data as well. If we press um, this S right here means show, we can press show as licorice. <laughs> These are all the atoms 
uh, in the keratin molecule, yeah, in this particular keratin molecule. So check it out, right? We can look at, for example, um, all these nitrogens, right? That's an arginine right there. That's a carboxylic acid, right? So all these different amino acids, and we can start to piece together um, what these things are. Now, this is a little complex to look at, all right? I went on the website and the proteins have random letters and numbers for some reason. Yeah, so they all have a, a they ha all have a unique code. They all have a specific code that means, oh, if you fetch this, it's that specific protein. And so those numbers and letters don't necessarily mean something. I mean, they might, but it's not really important. Yes, Leo. When I went on Pymol, it said you have to sign up or do something. I think you do have to have a registration license. Um, but I think some, some schools should have that. So maybe you can, I mean, I'm not sure about uh, middle school and elementary school, but um, I think high schools and most colleges should have this license. It's a pretty useful program, yeah? Now we have alpha helices, right? And alpha helices are held together by hydrogen bonds. We can view those bonds by going to A, find, we can find polar contacts. And we can look at all these, this might take a while, honestly. Let's see, if we select this entire molecule, let's see. Let's say I want to select, uh, if I select this chain, right? And I want to select that, and I want to find all of the hydrogen bonds. Look at that, right? We can see where all the hydrogen bonds are to the, to the waters, right? And to other water molecules. And we can also look at it with, with, with itself, so we can also, this might work. So find any contacts. Let's say find polar contacts within selection. Right now we can see all the hydrogen bonds between the atoms. And of course, the alpha helix, the alpha helix is held together by those hydrogen bonds. And so now we can think about as bioengineers, or you know, if you, do, if you go into synthetic biology, you can start to think about if I mutate something here, what will happen to the structure? Or if I mutate this enzyme, this amino acid right here at this point, how might that affect certain properties? Yeah. Now, let me initialize. You can also view it in different ways. So if I go here, you can look at all the different ways you can look at these molecules. You can look at it using lines, as sticks, as spheres, and as a surface. Right? So the surface is, imagine rolling a ball over the surface of the molecule. That's what it might look like. A mesh, that's probably what the electron contours look like. Dots, ribbons, cartoons. Right? Cartoons are typically what you look at mostly. And so if we go back to another demonstration um, file, let me see. The next one I have is called uh, 3-EEB. So this is a cysteine protease from cholera, 3-EEB. So I'm going to say fetch 3-EEB. Check it out, right? This is our molecule right here. We can color it in any way we want. We can color it by chain, for example. So these are two polypeptides. And we can look at the ligands, right? So ligands are things that are attached to this protein, right? That's a ligand right there. What is that ligand? Um, we can look it up on the website. And it turns out that that ligand is um, a, an activator of the protein, I believe. So if I search up 3EEB, let me uh, share my screen again. If I search, let's see. Have they added the spike protein? Probably. <laughs> yeah, probably. Leo says, I have some proteins you can try. Oh, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Put the four letter code in the chat. I'd, I'd be glad to look at it. All right. So let's look at the um, 5LMJ. Ooh, what is that one? Let's take a look. 5LMJ. Ah, cool. <laughs> This is a llama nanobody. So nanobodies are parts of, anti uh, they're kind of like mini antibodies. You can think of them like that. When you bioengineer a protein, how many amino acids do you need to change in order to change the protein's function to what you want? That depends. So sometimes a single mutation is all you need. Sometimes you need a, a few or like tens. So it really depends. Um, you have to experiment with that. Is changing one enough or would you have to alter 50? So sometimes there are really important amino acids. So this is why the structure is so important, right? you want to know where the important amino acids are. And so if you look at the structure and you look at where things bind, you can start to think about, well, if I mutate this amino acid to become positive or negative or hydrophobic, you can imagine how that might affect binding to ligands or binding to other proteins, right? PPI, protein-protein interactions. 
So that actually kind of gets into what I was wanting to go to next. Let me go back to 3EB. And there's actually a thing you can do in the plugin, APBS electrostatics. What that does is it actually calculates the positive and negative charges on your molecule. Right? So let's just run this. And hopefully it will run while we're talking. So um, Mavi says, what does it mean for amino acids to be positive? Yes, so positive charge. So things like arginine, lysine, histidine. Um, you can change the properties of amino acids in order to manipulate the structure and manipulate the functions and properties at certain locations. Yeah. So this is calculating the electrostatic surface. So we're waiting on this computation to take place. And what you'll notice is you'll see a very distinct binding pocket. All right. Oh, so Leo has another one. Awesome. 4W2Q. I'll, I'll go to that one after this, this runs. So hopefully it'll, this might take a while, right? Computation takes a long time. But it's calculating the forces. It's calculating the energy of a proton as it's rolling around the surface of the molecule. So imagine taking a proton and rolling it around the molecule to calculate its energy. And it's loading. And this is what you get. <laughs> Check it out. Yeah, so the, the white parts are neutral. Blue is positive. Red is negative. Right? Check it out. That's where that ligand binds. Right? Look at that. It's very, very clearly blue. Right? There's this positively charged cleft. There's, a, there's literally a hole in that molecule. I wouldn't say hole, like a cleft, where the molecule goes in. And it binds, and that can then maybe change the protein shape in some way, right? And so now we can, it looks kind of weird, <laughs> yeah. And so there's probably some kind of amino acids here, and we can also find the polar context, right? And now we can see how, oh my gosh, this ligand is hydrogen bonded to a whole bunch of different places. That's how it's bonded. That's how it's bound to that protein, right? That's that interaction. So any questions about electrostatics? It is super cool, <laughs> right? You can literally see this, this cleft. And you can also start thinking about, well, what if I change an amino acid there? What if I change it from positive to negative, right? Oh, well, then the ligand might not bind as well. So for instance, if you don't want, for example, oh, so say, for example, if you don't want a toxin to bind at a, cer at a certain allosteric site on the enzyme or at a protein, you can mutate the amino acid. Hopefully, that won't mess up the enzyme active site, but maybe that'll block that toxin from binding there. So I can think about all these different ways. What other molecules can you roll over the surface of a protein? Oh, well, I guess proton is kind of like conventional, right? So as you, wrote, as you roll a proton around this, end, uh, around this protein, of course, it's going to be higher in energy if it's around positively charged residues. And so that's why this is going to be blue. Um, it's going to be lower in energy around these red areas. And so we use a proton because it's positively charged. You can just as easily use an electron, but com by convention, it's, it's a proton. All right, awesome. Leo, let's look at yours, shall we? Let's do fetch uh, 4W2Q. Ah, so this is um, an antibody with a, C, with a nuclear protein C terminal domain, whatever that means. All right, check it out. We can it, color it, it by structure. Yeah, it says yeah, like yeah. antivirus. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's an antibody, right? So you can see the antibody is maybe binding to something, right? So let's look at how it's binding, what shall we? Let's use A, find any contacts, right? Or I guess polar contacts um, within selection, right? Look at that, right? Those are all the hydrogen bonds <laughs> that these things form with itself. And that's why it's bonded together. Yeah, that's why the antibody is pretty specific, I guess. So you can, you can imagine all these sort of things happening at the molecular level. Could you use pymol to test what would happen if a toxin or substrate binds to the enzyme after you engineer the protein? Ah, so that's a good question. And let's just do it, shall we? <laughs> what is Marburg virus? I don't know. <laughs> Some kind of virus. Let's do it, right? So let's, let's use another example. I have another example in my PowerPoint. So let's look at this other one. Um, fetch 7AHL. All right, let's do that. So let's reinitialize. Let's do fetch 7 ahl so this right here is a protein that some bacteria staphylococcus uses to, to punch holes into your cells 
to kill your immune cells, to kill your blood cells. And so you see that hole right there? Ions can float in and out of that hole if it's punched through a membrane. And so this is called alpha hemolysin. And let's color by chain, yeah? And you can see this beautiful, you know, what, what is it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, heptameric structure, right? Now let's zoom in on just one. So let's say that I want to select only this chain. I can select chain. Let's say I want to focus on this chain right here. And I want to hide everything else, but show only this one. Let's show it as licorice. Yeah. So some person, um, let's see, who asked that? So Jeannie asked, well, what if I want to alter something? Guess what? <laughs> You're in luck. So let's say I want to alter a residue. All right. So I want to alter this residue, let's say. Let's select that one. Let's zoom in on it, orient. I want to mutate this, this substrate. Uh, sorry, not substrate. I want to mutate this amino acid. What I can do is I can go right here, wizard, mutagenesis. I want to mutate it as a protein. All right. Now I can basically select this and I can mutate it. Let me mutate this to, let's say, a lysine. Uh, lysine. Right? And apply. Boom. To this right here. Ah, there you go. <laughs> now there's lysine there, right? So you see how we've changed the amino acid to lysine. And you can actually predict, you know, using this program, um, if you mutate this amino acid here, what might that look like? What kind of bonds will it make? You know, how might it interact with other residues nearby? Um, one QOH? Yeah, sure. I'll look at that soon, all right? So you can mutate things as well. So you can look at these different structures. And you can also zoom in and out, right, via this axis of, of viewing. And so I also want to show you something that you can do here. We've seen electrostatics, right? What if we want to look at the hydrophilic and hydrophobic amino acids? So let me restart again. Let me fetch 7-AHL. And now I want to color it. First of all, the water is kind of annoying. So let me just get rid of the water, remove waters, right? I want to select all the polar residues. So I want to select polar. I have a script written already. All this stuff you can just copy and paste from online. Select polar. I'm going to select all these polar residues. Enter. Uh, let's see. Did you mean one of these? Let's see. What's going on here? Maybe it can't be capitalized? Uh, maybe the parentheses are the issue. What if I do that? Huh. Select polar. What if I just do P? Did you mean one of these? Select. Oh, I know why. <laughs> because I didn't. There's too many, I shouldn't capitalize that S, that's why. That S should be lowercase, there we go. Select, ah, there we go. I've selected all the polar residues. Now let's select the hydrophobic residues. I'm gonna do select uh, hydrophobes, all right? Just copy and paste that. All this is from online, guys. So you just select that, all right? All the hydrophobic molecules are right there. Let me select the charged ones too, all right? So I'm gonna select charged, just like that, boom. Now, let's color it so that I, I can see what is what. Yes, Leo, color. Later, try one QOH. Oh, yeah, sure thing. Um, I'm, I'm a little running out of time. I've got 10 minutes left, so I'll do that. Maybe it comes after from the e. session, and I'll stay around for a few minutes. It's produced by E. coli. I just saw it. Oh, cool. That's awesome. So I'll look at that after then. So let's let's view this as a surface. Let's go here, show as surface. And we can see that it's calculating the surface of this molecule. And I've colored it so that all of the polar ones are red, all of the hydrophobic ones are white. Look at that. <laughs> you can very clearly see where this inserts into the membrane, right? Of course it's there, because that's where the hydrophobic residues are. So it sticks into the membrane right there. That's where it pokes a hole into your cell. There's also a thing where you can uh, press shift and right click and you can look at a cross section. So let's do that. You can look at a cross section through this, right? And you can see how it's hydrophobic along the interior of this, right? This is the surface of the molecule, 
And you can also make this transparent and look at the inside. So if I go to display, where is it? Uh, two, two, two. I'm oh, sorry, setting, transparency, surface, 50%. Um, what if I do this? Let me show this, um, show the cartoon. Aha, there you go, see? Now it's transparent and you can see both the cartoon and the surface around it, all right? So cool thing you can do with these. Now, Leo wanted, requested something, let's see. One QOH, ready? Fetch, one QOH. Oh gosh, I forgot to reinitialize. So fetch Q10H and you get this thing. This is a, a toxin. <laughs> it's a mutant shiga like toxin. All right, so check this out. We have all these things here, we can color it. Um, we can also do the same thing before, right? Let's select the polar ones. Let's select the hydrophobe, let's select the charged, right? Let's color it, let's see what we get, shall we? Let's color it red, let's color these red, and let's color the hydrophobes white again, why not, right? And you can see that there's a pattern here, maybe not as pronounced as a membrane protein, which is probably expected, right? And let's show it as a surface. All right, awesome. So we see that there's a whole bunch of units here, right? And so you can see that there are a whole bunch of these hydrophobic things on the outside. And maybe if we take a cross section, we'll be able to see the inside, right? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you can look at the inside, the interior of the molecule, right? Now, for the last seven minutes, I want to show you guys something else as well. So in, I guess before I do this, in um, evolution, right, how might we use this to think about evolution. Because if you think about it, proteins are from DNA, right? DNA encodes the information to hold, to, to um, process for these proteins. The surface looks weird. <laughs> so Mahi asks, so the hydrophobicity, hydrophilicity can be determined by the software, which can determine the function of the protein, like how it enters. No, so that's up to our interpretation, right? So function is from us. The software can calculate which amino acids are hydrophilic, which are hydrophobic, but we have to interpret that. And so we have to look at what polar contacts there are, where are the hydrogen bonds, and we can then determine the function of the protein. So typically, if, for example, it's an enzyme, then we'll know previously what the enzyme does. And then, so for example, DMJ Hamti, we know that it catalyzes the formation of biofuels, but the question is how? And so I wanna zoom in, of course I can't show you guys because I don't have the structure, right? But if I were to zoom in on the active site of that enzyme, then I can actually look at what amino acids are important for coordinating that, that reaction. And I can mutate this to maybe another amino acid to optimize, um, hopefully. You can identify the similarities of a protein found in two species. Exactly, right? If two species are closely related, or if their genes, we can describe gene lineages. If their genes are closely related, we also expect their protein shapes to be related. Let's do that, right? So. We can also fetch multiple molecules. So here I have um, two GFX. I will fetch two GFX, and I will also fetch one TQY. Fetch one TQY, and I have these two proteins here. Right? Couldn't you just look at the protein code to do that though? Why would you need to look at the structure? Yes, exactly. So the Typically, you would look at the code as well, right? So the sequence itself might tell you about the similarity, and it does. Right? So more similar sequences will also give you more similar proteins. However, the structure might give you a deeper layer of insight. Right? It'll tell you, well, if these two molecules are literally overlapping in space like that, well, we know that there are certain conserved regions. So it's not just, you know, the sequence that's conserved. We can see it in 3D. And so then we can start to understand how the structure plays into this conservation in evolutionary time. So you can use this to create vaccines. <laughs> I wouldn't say create vaccines, but you can use it to visualize the proteins, right? So the molecule is that the vaccine, if the vaccine induces an antibody that your body makes, you can crystallize the antibody and you can maybe visualize how the antibody binds to the antigen, right? And you can then start to engineer the antibody maybe or, or evolve that antibody to be better at what it does. So let's align these, right? Let's, let's look at how these two are evolutionarily related. Now this big one right here, Right, this is like a, a pretty big hefty protein. It turns out that it's actually multiple units of the same thing. And so I only want to select one chain of that. And so I'm going to select chain. I'm going to select, let's say just this one. 
I'm going to hide everything else, but only show that one as licorice. Uh, not, not licorice, I'm going to show it as cartoon. Cartoon, yeah? So at first, these two might not look too similar. Right? Maybe you see like some similarities here and there, but let's look at how they might align, right? What about 3, 1, 2, D? Yes, sure thing. <laughs> You're on. Let's align it. Let's go to plugin and we can align. So let's align um, our mobile selection. Uh, let's do this one. Yeah, let's align and let's do OK. Let's see. Oh, you know what? I might have to do this. So I might have to. Okay, let me do this. Let me make it so that I'm focusing. Let's see. So currently it's not right on top of each other. Let's do this. What if I want to select only this chain and I want to align only that one? So what do I do, select? <laughs> um, okay. Ah, there we go. Now they're on top of each other, right? We've we've aligned our selection with our other protein. And now check it out, right? They're actually pretty similar. <laughs> and we're gonna them like this. So you can see how there might be a few differences, right? Those loops might be different right there. There's a few extra residues coming out here. But overall, the architecture is kind of similar, right? So we can start to see how um, certain things take place. And that's where the thing binds, right? We can see where the hydrogen bonds are. If we do this, we can find polar contacts like that. And we also modify our selection. We can modify it to go around. That expands our selection. And we can also show this as licorice. Now check it out, right? I only want my selection. So let's see only the selection. Now I want to hide everything else, but I want to only show this selection, right? There we go. Let's orient ourselves to this thing. Now check it out, right? You can see all the amino acids that this ligand is binding to. And we can do a selection, we can label it, label L residues, and we can see what residues this thing is binding to, right? So it's kind of cool that you can see on the molecular level after all your work of crystallizing and you know determining the diffraction pattern and solving the structure, now you can start to see what the payoff is. Right? You can start to see what the actual atomic interactions are. All right, so I am pretty much out of time. There's a whole lot of stuff you can do with PyMol, right? You can, you can mutate things, you can even bend things around. So this is kind of like a teaser for you guys. You can edit as well. So say for instance, I wanna edit this residue right here. I can go like this and I can basically <laughs> do this. I can basically like make it wobble around. Right? I can adjust the shape of the protein to what I like it, right? And I can make it, I can basically morph it in whatever way I want. So you can, there's a whole lot of stuff you can do with PyMol. And that was just a very quick sort of intro to what you can do. So 